Okay, so for chapter three, easy problems. I think, yeah, one to four. All right, so we have, um, yeah, we have this code over here and this, I think we have went through this so many times now. Um, and then because this chapter is about um, intervals, point estimates and posterior predictive checks. So what we do is just, well, we um, run through this code and then afterwards um, answer this, the answer the following problems, which I find can actually be done in one line of code, even though or at a glance, um, yeah, the sentence looks scary, but then apparently not uh, in terms of code. So I'm doing um, the code in slightly different manner. So I'm using the, um, the translation of the book by Solomon Kurtz. Um, in which he did everything using BRMS and tie deferreds, but it's practically the same. So this is for setting up the table. So instead of assigning, um, let's see, yeah, assigning um, the likelihood and posterior to a factor, we put everything in a data frame. And then here, the slice sample replaces the sample, but Everything is practically the same, except for the prop argument, we use the weight by. Um, okay. So the first question is how much posterior probability lies below P um, 0 0.2? And you know, what we can do is just take the mean uh, directly. So the average of the, um, samples that are below 0.2, or we can also, oh, I haven't loaded my packages. Yeah, I have to run this first. Okay, so this shows, um, so I have 0 0.001, and in percentage, it means 0.1%. So there's only 0.1% of data below um, this line. So does anyone get the same answer so far? I'm not sure whether the seed actually helps here. I had a little bit different answer, um, but it was very, very small like that. And it's probably just due to, you know, um, Sam obviously the samples are going to be, you know, different depending on, you know, there's an inherent randomness. So, but very similar, like 0 0.001, 0 0.002. Okay. All right. And then the next one is just uh, the same, but um, P above 0 0.8. And yeah, so the same code just change the 0 0.2 to 0 0.8. So we have 0 0.09. And then for this one, so we're um, getting the sort of like the density between this interval and, and we have around 90% uh, lies within uh, this range. And then for the, um, yeah, for the question number four, so question number four and five is actually just finding uh, the quantile or the percent, the 20th percentile of, um, of this. So because here, the posterior probability that lies below this value of P, so just use 0.2. And yeah, oh yeah. It's actually quite connected to the fifth one, I just realized. So yeah, I get. I think Laura can take over after this, but does anyone have um, any questions so far? Is there anything unclear? I would say the sentence looks scary, but then in terms of code, I would say it's really straightforward. Just to make sure I'm understanding this, these are samples from the, the posterior curve. 
which is like one of the alternatives to just like finding the integral under it. Mm, yeah. So the area under the curve, yeah. Yeah, so, well, if I understand correctly what we are doing here, so in D we have the, um, the grid of parameters and then we weight all these um, possible parameters by the posterior that we have. And well, if the posterior for a certain parameter is um, higher, then that is a high probability we're going to get that um, parameter. And so what we, it, yeah, to my understanding, what we have here are the distribution of the parameters that are possible given the data. So, and then, yeah, what we are doing here are just um, sort of like getting a mass below this 0.2 line or above the 0.8 or uh, between this interval and so on. Great, thanks. Okay, so I guess I can stop sharing so far. Okay, I'll share my screen. Um, can you all see it okay? Yep. Great. Okay, so I think um, yeah, we already did question five. So this questions easy six and seven were pretty straightforward in my mind. Um, so I just copied the text here, which values of P contains the narrowest interval equal to 66% of the posterior prob. And that's that handy from the rethinking package HPDI. So just samples. I did not do the tidyverse um, solutions. I, sh I should probably look into that for the next chapter, but I honestly didn't even think about it. So you're gonna be getting base R um, from my answers here. And then um, 6P equals 0 0.66. And then what is that? Let me run that again. <laughs> so that's, your answer might be different depending on your samples, of course. Um, and then, which values of P contain 66% of the posterior prob, assuming equal posterior prob both below and above the interval. Um, so this is just that PI function. So in this case, I think we had, was this a six out of nine? So the distribution was relatively symmetrical. So, um, and I, I just plotted it with the dense function just to kind of see. So it's not super different really. Um, and then so that's, that's a plotting of the density, fairly symmetrical looks like to me at least, um, based on first glance. Any questions, corrections, comments? Looks good to me. Cool. Okay. Um, Mikhail, I think you were doing questions one and two, right? Medium? Yes. Let me stop sharing real quick. All right, so um, question uh, three and one. So again, a globe passing, but now um, the number of trials and successes are different. So we are using the same um, parameter grid we flat prior, so everything's one. And then we use, uh, so the data, we have eight um, successes in five, 15 pluses. So divide them eight and 15 here with the grid um, of the parameters that we have. And yeah, so it's basically just like um, our the question that we have here, but just changing the number of successes and uh, trials. And if you are looking at the, um, what else? Yeah, if you're looking at the posterior, then it's slightly leaning toward the um, 
uh, toward the right um, right hand side of the 0.5 line, but not that much. And and then the question is, and for the second question, we are going to draw 10,000 samples from the um, grid approximation and afterwards calculate the 90% HPDI. So again, um, just like before, we are um, we are sampling the parameters, uh, and then now we use uh, 10,000 instead of only um, 1,000. And afterwards, we get the 90% highest density interval, and we will get this um, number. So I'm not sure whether now that we have um, 10 times more sample, the answers among us are closer. So what do you have? I had 0.3293 to 0.7167, so. Hmm, quite close. We're within a couple of hundreds, I guess. Five hundreds, maybe. Yeah, I think for uh, this one, the question 3E6 and 7, mine is quite different from Laura's, but um, I would say the way I did it is practically the same, but. I guess because I have uh, fewer samples, uh, because, well, we use fewer samples, then our answers are not that similar. Which makes me wonder, though, then what is the, um, how useful is setting the seed going to be? Because it seems that we're not getting exactly the same answer. So, Yeah, I wonder if we, there's a difference. Did everybody, did you try the HPDI function from um, the rethinking package? I wonder if they're different. Let me quickly try that. They might have different rounding or something. I don't know. Not exactly the same. Yeah, so I wonder if the setting seed will give us um, the same answers in our own machine or the same answers across different machines. I have no idea about that. I think it should be the same, but I mean, one thing to, to know is like if you even if you sample it twice, right, you'll get you'll the second you know version will be different from the first unless you set the seed each time yeah. before. You sample it. But I don't know if that's it. That's just a possibility. Oh. Yeah, I'm trying repeatedly sampling and it varies quite a bit in the second decimal place actually. Yeah, I'm also repeating the sampling um, and I get exactly the same answers, but yeah. Yeah, I thought the seed um, ensures that everyone get the, get the same answers, but. I wonder if yeah. maybe the fact that uh, uh, on the book, uh, uh, they use the sample, the base sample function while using the slice sample from Tidyverse uh, Maybe even if we set the, the same seed, uh, uses a different internal procedure. And so I think that the seed, uh, if I do another operation before the seed, uh, before the sampling, my sample will be different uh, rather than setting the seed sampling and then doing an operation. Because every operation starts from the same point, but if you, you change the, the, the order, uh, it might change the outcome, but I'm not 100% sure. I think like, you know, kind of philosophically, it's probably okay to just accept 
the small amount of variation too. You know, as long as it's like approximate, then yeah. I think that's part of the spirit of the whole. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, it is quite different. So I tried the sample and the slice sample. It is quite different, but not that um, different. So yeah. Okay, now I know. So I guess Laura can continue. Yeah, I can continue. Um... Okay, um, so question three was, let's see, construct a posterior predictive check for this model and data. This means simulate the distribution of samples averaging over the posterior uncertainty in P. What is the probability of observing eight water and 15 tosses? So I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, I also realized I did this the hard way, thinking very much what I was doing instead of just doing mean, but hey, live and learn, right? So I run this, you get about 0 0.14, 0 0.15. Is that similar to what other folks got? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, then three is using the posterior distribution constructed from the new eight out of 15 data. Now calculate the probability of observing six water and nine tosses. So this is basically what I did is we have the same, this is nine, and then I'm gonna say I'm looking for six, right? So it's this very similar methodology. That's similar to what other folks got? I actually got 0.116. And I okay. have 0 0.171. Point one seven one. So that's closer to what? Uh, that that would I, that point one seven one certainly seems like that could be just different. Um, yeah. Based on the random variation. Any other comments about that? Or Kent, I think that was you. Do you want to comment on your process? Um, it's exactly the same, except that I. Okay, just, Elliot says he got something point. Away. Oh, here I see. No, I've got a, I've got a coding error. Well, and I know how that I can have, happen. I, have point, I was looking at the old weights from the previous one. Okay, well then that um, makes sense. So now cool. I got one point one seven five one. So that's that's very close. Yeah, I think we're all kind of the same. Okay, so then this question is, we're changing our prior, basically. So we're starting over going through three medium one through four, but now we're going to use a prior that is, so we have some idea that the earth is mostly water. Um, P is zero, zero if prior is zero, if P um, on that P grid is less than 0 0.5 and it's a constant, can be anything, we'll just use one for P is um, above P equals 0 0.5. Okay, so basically we're sort of go through a lot of the code um, and you've seen this before. So just a lovely if else statement, doing the eight out of 15. I do this new samples. I just put new in front of everything. And we'll run this so we can see. Oh, you know, I might have already run it before. So what was notable to me is that in the six out of nine, this is all is pretty similar, right? But it's a little bit narrower. Um, the six out of nine, which is fairly close to, is, is a lot higher than it was before. Well, maybe not a lot, I think it was 0 0.18, 0 0.17, which to me is the effect of saying, we, we have information that makes us think that it's going to be above 0 0.5. 8 out of 15 is closer to 2.5. So this is a little bit higher, but probably not by much. But this was interesting to me just to, to see that, how, how the um, intervals change a little bit and then how our confidence in, in that estimate of the tosses changes. Any other comments about that? I'm sure some people might have more succinct analytical ways of stating that than I just did.
Well, I don't hear anything. So if you think of something, feel free to chime in later. So question, I'll move on to the next question. Um, now this is fair warning ahead of time. I approach this in a very like sort of simulation based mentality. There's probably a lot better way to do this, but this kind of, I guess, helped me think about it. So I'm curious to see what other people, if anyone else did this question, what they did. Um, so suppose you want to estimate the Earth's proportion of water very precisely. You want the 99th percentile interval, the posterior distribution of P, to be only 0 0.5 wide. Um, so we're not really caring about what that estimate is, but we want it to be very precise. Uh, this means that the diff distance between the upper and lower bound of the interval should be 0 0.05. How many times do you have to toss the globe to do this? So I'm gonna just walk through this code here. <laughs> Hopefully this makes sense and y'all can um, let me know if you don't like it or things you would change. And there are actually a lot of parameters that you could change. I was playing around with this earlier today that will give you different answers for how many times you would need to toss the globe. Um, so what I did is I defined a size. This is how many times we toss, right? And just doing a little bit of playing around, I said, okay, 100 to 10,000 going up by one. I could have done different increments, but I just chose to do that. And then I'm not even good, I'm not worrying about what the true proportion is, right? So I'm gonna say just round, assuming that we get on average 0.7 of the size. And that's probably a fairly reasonable assumption because we're starting at 100 tosses, we're going up to 10,000. 10, so, um, then I find a function, which I'm going to use in a map function, a PMAP function. And this is based on X and size. So I probably didn't need this actually. I just you know, I kept that in there. Here's that P grid, right? I just, I should have come up with new variable names, but I didn't for these. Um, so I decide, I wasn't sure in terms of thinking about the prior, if um, we wanted to do a flat prior or a kind of, um, an if else prior. My sense of these questions is that they tend to build on each other. So I just chose to go with the flat prior. However, you could probably like nest a map function or something. I didn't have time to think about that and try that out. And it does change, I will say, how many, how many trials you need to, or how many tosses you need, my, my bad, to do that. So then here's the new likelihood d binome x equals x size equals size, prob equals new P grid. Um, so then, you know, you probably recognize this code and kind of the sampling, right, of the, um, the new posterior. And then what I did, I wasn't sure first whether to use the HDPI or the PI, but I just went with the PI. I think that was what was implied. Um, and so 0 0.99 as a numeric, this is an integer. If you, uh, I'm sorry, it's a vector, a numeric vector. And then a data frame, so that returns it. I already ran this because it takes a little bit to run because it's like a bunch of things. So I mapped it using PMAP DFR. And then um, I did plot it just to kind of, um, kind of see what was going on. And then I wanted to see um, okay, where is that prediction interval difference between the upper and lower bound less than or equal to 0 0.5? So let me show you. This is kind of interesting to me, the plotting here. So the prediction interval starts out like, you know, fairly large, 0.2, close to 0 0.3, I guess. And then it certainly doesn't go down. There's a lot of variation here, but you can see around 2,500, when you toss at 2,500, you can get a really, really narrow, inter um, that narrow interval. So then I also just, the data frame I filtered around, yeah, which is around 2,100, 20, a little over 2,100 is where you start to see it. And there's, again, that random variation there. That's how I approached it. Um, if you don't have, if, if you have a flat prior, it takes longer to get that narrow interval. Um, so that was, that was how I approached it. It's probably not the best way, but it kind of helped me intuitively think through it. So I will stop sharing there and uh, 
Anybody want to comment? Different approaches? Probably a much more efficient way to do this, but. I did the same thing. I did a simulation approach. I'm okay, cool. If anybody thought of a more analytic way to do it. Well, Kent, the fact that you thought about that makes me feel good about myself. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I'm glad we, I'm glad I, I was like I'm on the same track. I was like, because I was trying to approach it. How do you back into it? It's like, well, you kind of have to simulate through a bunch of different, and it is really interesting. Pri I mean, I think I do think that just from personal experience, working through these problems really helps because when you change priors, that really changes things quite a bit. Um, what's also interesting that I'll comment on, I'm, I don't want to try to run this as with live screen sharing, so I don't know if it'll crash. But um, if, for example, like we have, if else P grid is less than 0 0.501, let's say that I assume that, let's say we're, you know, the true proportion is 0.51, right? And I had this be like 0 0.51. So on average, I'm going to get about 50%. But I, all I know, you're going to converge much, you're not going to have to toss that globe as much because you're kind of like on that boundary portion of like your prior. Um, and then conversely, as I mentioned, if you don't have, um, you just have a flat prior, it's going to take you longer, um, no matter, you know, what, what the, you know, long run true estimate, um, true parameter is. So that was kind of, um, I don't know, it helped me kind of learn some things doing it that way. So stop sharing. Did, did anyone else have a non-simulation method of answering this? No. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is it my turn then? Yes. Let me share. There you go. Can you see that? So the, yes. the hard the hard problems are all about um, sex of the birth of a first and second child. And the, the data set is two vectors when with um, the sex of the birth of the first child and the sex of the birth, the, the sex of the second born child in a hundred families. And the data is in these birth one and birth two vectors. So the total number of boys in the 200 births is 111. Using grid approximation, compute the posterior distribution for the probability of being a boy. So this is the same kind of stuff we've been seeing a lot, I think. With just 200 children, a grid size of 1E4, and just making the grid, the likelihood is the binomial. Um, and then which parameter value maximizes posterior probability? That's just looking for the maximum, which is 0.555. And I like to, to graph these. So here's a graph of the probability of a boy. The dense, it's the density graph of probability of the boy. And the dotted line is at the 0.555. So that's the, um, the overall posterior probability of a boy in all these 200 births and draw random parameter values and estimate the um, posterior density. Again, this is pretty straightforward. So just sampling uh, from the grid according to the posterior and looking at the, um, what does this stand for? Posterior, the, the interval. So I don't know, I don't find these very interesting. Um, then simulate, uh, 200 births and compare the predicted number of boys to the actual count in the data. So just going through um, this posterior probability and, and simulating um, 200 births according to these samples, again, plotting it out. And that looks like it's a pretty good fit. This model is a good fit for the overall data. This dotted line is the actual number of boys, 111. And that's central to the, the distribution. Um, so that part is pretty straightforward and nothing too, uh, nothing too unusual. But now the idea is to look um, just at the uh, number of boys in the first births, 
birth one. And so compare, simulate 100 firstborns and compare it to the number of boys in the first birth. So in the first boys, there's 51. Um, and then the simulation is the same binomial of 100 births, according to the samples, and plot that. And now it doesn't line up so well. So the curve is the, is the simulated density of the number of boys. And the actual number of boys is um, actually down at about the 25th percentile. So I don't know if that's to the point of like, you know, being crazy, but it it's definitely doesn't match up with the model. So there, there's some, some mismatch between the number of boys in the first 100 births compared to the predicted number of boys um, in the overall number of births. Then I asked that we look at the second births after female firstborns and, and look at how the model predicts the number of boys in those second births. So first we need to know how many firstborn girls are there. There's 49. And how many boys were born after firstborn? So here I'm filtering the birth to by the locations in birth one that are equal to zero. So this is all the, this is all the second births where the first birth was a girl. And the number of boys there is 39. So this is already a little interesting that 39 out of 49 births were boys in the second birth after a girl is the first birth. And then looking what the model predicts to that is the same binomial uh, sampling with just from 49, um, 49 instances. Charting that, now this is um, very unusual. The, the model doesn't fit at all in predicting the number of boys born after girls. This vertical line is the 39. And this is actually at the like 99.95 percentile of the prediction. So the, the model says something very different from what actually happened. And my interpretation of this is that there's some strong selection. Um, I, I guess is this might be from China when they had the two child policy. And I believe there was uh, quite a lot of, you know, this is my understanding. Somebody please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong or, or culturally insensitive or anything, but my understanding is when this policy was in place, there was a, a lot of selection pressure on, a lot of desire to have at least one boy. So if the first child was a girl, then um, the second, I mean, I don't know exactly how they were selecting, but the, so they would try to have a boy the second time around. Um, and that's what this data seems to show. Yeah, I mean, that's where my thought was going is probably, sex selective abortions probably i mean yeah not to wait in any controversial topics i'm just yeah that's what i'm thinking is probably going on here yeah um, given where that is word. in the tail yeah i think so Something. um so that's the hard any any questions or, or other comments so I'm plotting the density estimate using um, the dense function in the rethinking package and mm -hmm. the line actually looks really jagged. So I can show you. Yeah, the, the um, dense function, yeah. the, the smoothing in the dense function in the rethinking package is too small, in my opinion. There's I think a, so, yeah. There's a parameter to change that. Um, and if you, I, I forget what it's called, ABS maybe. Um, I think it's the norm comp. The so it, it, it also ADD. allows to, yeah, to overlay with the normal distribution, normal density oh, okay. comparison. Yeah. But, the yeah. but it looks so weird. Um, do you want to do you want to show what you have? Yeah, sure. Um, so I get pretty much the same answer, but um, yeah. So it looks really weird. Yeah, uh, it's all until like... the histogram is okay. But so then yeah, it looks weird. And your it dense very call, jagged. If yeah, you if you add like in it. ADJ equals one. Yeah, I can also do uh, this just to show how it will actually look like if I have the curve. Huh, why are nothing's appearing? Mm. Yeah, so I think this should be how it is. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. just add, yeah, I can also... add that, change it to one and it will be much smoother. Yeah. Yeah, now we're uh, seeing the thing. Yeah. It's probably, I mean, the density curve is very sensitive to the bandwidth. And I think probably because they're only integer values in the data, it's putting little peaks at every integer. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it's just an artifact of the way density curves are computed. It basically puts a little, um, puts a little Gaussian normal curve at every value of the data and then adds them all up. And so they just is changing the width of that uh, normal curve. I definitely think he can use a better uh, default here. Yeah, I agree. At least with yeah. when the data is integer data, maybe if the data was more continuous, it would make more sense. Yeah. Is that everybody? Did anybody do the, the uh, class homework questions? I totally forgot about those, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I thought we won't have enough time. So yeah, why bother at this point? But yeah, apparently we have quite some time uh, left. Yeah, we're early today. So next week we're gonna do chapter four and the, the I think the first of the lectures, is that right? Um, also the lecture, yeah. Yeah, we can. Um, so what's the question for the first week? And there's actually only four questions. So I guess, yeah, I guess we can try answering this um, class homework and then oh. afterwards um, do the exercise and the problem in the chapter. What do you all think? Do because I find from it, the first week, yeah. Because I find it nice that uh, we keep uh, doing this um, uh, formula of the grid prior, and then prior likelihood and posterior. It really um, hammers everything down um, into my head. Yeah, I find it quite nice to do it um, repeatedly. So I'm sorry, I don't know if I understand. Are we doing the first half of chapter four next week? I haven't looked at the videos to see how uh, Dr. McElrath divides it up. Um, I, I don't, yeah, if you just, I, I probably missed something. So just what are we doing next week? So, well, I'm su uh, suggesting uh, to first do the um, uh, class homework. So for the, um, for yeah, the homework oh, that chapter is chapter three, gotcha. The or the no, um, no, no for the uh, for no. the week one homework. The, the homework, the, the week one homework, which is one yeah. through three. Isn't that one through three that he kind of combines or less? There's, there's a homework problem set on the on the website for yeah. chapters one yeah. through three. I think Laura's just saying yes. it corresponds to chapter three in the book. Yeah, I, I, they're they're moving a yeah. lot faster in his course that he's teaching, and I think. The first like week was chapters one through three, so I would assume his yes. week one homework would correspond to chapters one through three. Yeah, and well, now that we have a finish uh, until chapter three, I guess we can try work um, that one out, and then afterwards we can continue with the um, regression if we ha um, have time. So chapter four of the book, because mm -hmm. I think. Chapter four and five is, well, they are quite thick in terms of uh, the number of pages. So I think we need more, well, I need quite some time to read all, all of those. So chapter four exercises next week. And maybe the homework. Although I think the first three homework questions are really pretty much similar to ones that we just went through. The, the fourth one is kind of interesting. The yeah. challenge.
I have a, I have a question. Uh, I have an offer. Um, after getting the, the um, so I have the first edition of the book and then we downloaded the pirated second edition and my, my guilty conscience got to me. So I got a, a copy of the second edition. So I have an extra copy of the first edition and um, was wondering if anybody would like it because I, I certainly don't need both. I don't know if you've all bought the book or if anybody hasn't bought the book. I, and I, I bought the book too, uh, Kent. My, I guess you could call it guilty conscience, sense of duty. I felt like people putting out open source materials for us to learn from, you know, it's nice to support those people who do yeah. that. So I felt a little bit, I am using the the PDF until my book comes, but, you know, I did pay the 80 something dollars, whatever it is for the book. Yeah, I actually bought a used copy. So it's like, all right, I guess that's supporting him. At least it yeah. makes hey, me it legal is. and it makes a market for it. But it, anyway, so I'm not hearing any takers for the first edition. I had um, the second edition for a year already, but I have never went through chapter one <laughs> uh, before this book club, no. It's just sitting nicely <laughs> on my shelf. All right. Well, I guess I'll give it to the uh, the people. I'll give it away somewhere locally if nobody wants it. Well, then I guess we can um, end the session for today, unless someone else has something to talk about. So yeah, I guess we can have more time for ourselves. All right. See you next week. Yeah. Everybody. See you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.